Hello everyone. In today's video, we'll be talking about demand forecasting. Let's first discuss the three laws of forecasting. These are the three laws of forecasting. The first law is that the forecast is always wrong. The second law states that the shorter the forecast horizon, the more accurate the forecast. Finally, the third law states that aggregate forecasts are more accurate than individual forecasts. Let's look at the first law first. The principle is that it is very difficult to predict the demand exactly because of randomness in demand. For example, if demand were normally distributed with the mean 100 and a standard deviation of 30, and you observe 100 realizations of demand, as shown in the figure below, you'll see that very rarely is the demand equal exactly to 100 or very close to 100. There's a lot of variability, and sometimes you see low demand, sometimes you see high demand. In a previous lecture, we had discussed the news vendor problem, and the news vendor problem shows us that it is costly to ignore demand variability. Let's consider this example where we are considering a bakery which sells donuts. Suppose the cost is $8, the selling price is $10, and the salvage value is zero. And let's also suppose that the daily demand is normal with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 30. What the news vendor model tells us is that the order quantity determines the expected profit. If we order the mean demand, which is 100, the expected profit is $80. However, if you order uh, the optimal order quantity, which happens to be 75, you get, you get an expected profit of $115, which is a profit increase of more than 40%. So what this example shows you is that if you take into account demand variability in the right way, for example, using the news vendor model, you can make the correct decision, ordering decision, which increases your profit quite dramatically. Please note that these calculations are for illustrative purposes only, and you do not need to know how to calculate the expected profit. The second law states that a shorter focus horizon is is usually gives you a better forecast than if you have a long-term forecast horizon. So as an example, it's much easier to predict the sales or the weather tomorrow than it is to predict the weather or the sales in six months. And this is because when you're trying to predict something, for example, the weather tomorrow, you know about the weather today, you know about the temperature, you know about where the clouds are, you know about how the wind is blowing. But six months from now, we don't know any of these things. So long-term forecasts tend to be noisier because there are many uncertainties which we are not able to observe. Uh, as Now that we understand what the second law of forecasting is, let's look at the example of Zara, which uses this second law to, to its benefit. Zara is known as a fast fashion retailer. Basically, what that means is that the time from their design to production to sale in their stores is very short. And Zara does, is able to accomplish this by uh, conf investing in its supply chain and making smart and ex or sometimes expensive choices in how it runs its supply chain. But the bottom line is that the production lead time for other competitors such as H&M can be as long as six months, whereas the production lead time for Zara is much shorter, around five weeks. Because Zara has a much shorter production lead time, it is able to make better demand forecasts about what customers want. The th third law states that aggregate forecasts are more accurate than individual forecasts. Basically what that means is a forecast for a group of uh, groups of things are better than forecasts for individual things. And this aggregation could be across products, across time, across locations, or you know some combination of these. 
For example, which is easier to predict? The sale of blue iPhone X XRs with 64 gigabytes of storage, or the sales of all colors in all storage levels of iPhone XRs? The reason why demand is easy to predict for groups is usually high demand in one uh, of one type will cancel out demand, low demand of another type. So kind of when you are taking the sum of many different demands, it tends to cancel out. Okay, what I said is not completely statistically rigorous, but this is not a statistics course, so I don't want to talk about the statistical details and make you lost or worried. Uh, to quantify this, you can look at the standard deviation and the coefficient of variation. Basically, the standard deviation measures the absolute variability of a random variable, whereas the coefficient of variation measures the relative variability. So for example, here the absolute variability is 100, and the relative variability is 20%. If you look at demand at a single store, the coefficient of variation is about 32%. On the other hand, if you look at the aggregate demand over 50 of this, 50 copies of this store, which are independent, you get a coefficient of variation of about 4%, which is much, much lower. Again, these calculations are just to illustrate the point that aggregate forecasts are more accurate. You don't have to know how to perform these calculations. Let's look at an example, Apple, which benefits from the third law of forecasting. In 2018, Apple had announced three uh, new phones, the iPhone XR and the iPhone XS and XS Max. Because there are different choices in terms of colors as well as storage levels, as well as these three models, it's quite difficult to predict demand for an, a particular model, color, and storage combination. However, one interesting thing about how the phones were designed is that all of these three phone models use the same system on a chip, which is the so-called A12 Bionic chip. Uh, so, even though it's hard to predict the demand of the individual combinations, it's much easier to predict the demand for the A12 Bionic chip. Let's now talk about forecasting methods. Broadly speaking, there are two types of forecasting methods, qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative methods are based on qualities or characteristics, whereas quantitative methods are based on quantities or measured values. Qualitative methods require the use of experts, such as Mr. Donald Trump, whereas uh, quantitative value methods require statistical, rely on statistical models. Qualitative methods are more useful in new situations, such as new products or markets, but quantitative methods are better when you have a lot insufficient historical data. Finally, qualitative methods tend to be subjective and inconsistent, whereas quantitative methods are objective and reproducible. So if you give the same numbers, the, the formula will give the same output. Whereas if even if you give the same inputs to a person, the person may make a different judgment based on whether he's tired, based on how he's feeling, based on what he had for lunch, and so on. The first qualitative forecasting method We'll discuss a so-called personal insight. Basically, it means one person making using his experience to make a forecast. The problem with this method is that it is highly subjective based on the person that you've picked. So in order to address this shortcoming, there's another method called panel consensus. Uh, the principle behind this is that Two or more is better than one, because sometimes one person will make a mistake, but it's rare that everyone in the group will make the mistake together. Other people might spot the mistake and help the person who makes the mistake out. So the panel consensus method relies on multiple experts sharing information and arriving at a forecast through a consensus. However, one shortcoming of the panel consensus method is that if there's 
one or two experts who are highly influential, they could manipulate the other experts to basically follow along what they feel. Then this uh, panel consensus method basically becomes a person, the personal insight of the highly influential experts. To address this shortcoming, uh, there's another method which is called the Delphi method. Basically, the, reason, the reasoning behind the Delphi method is that forecasts from a structured group of individuals is more accurate than those from an unstructured group. So it benefits from panel consensus with additional structure. Basically, the experts uh, do not meet together like in a meeting room. Instead, they, they communicate through a facilitator by answering anonymous questionnaires. And this facilitator will, will anonymize what people have entered and uh, summarize the information, including the forecast and the reasons for the forecast. And eventually, after multiple rounds, the, when the, the group might decide to have a arrive at a final forecast, which they will stop. And this, the strength of the Delphi method is that it is less susceptible to manipulation by an influential expert through the anonymity. And uh, right, so let's talk a little bit about quantitative forecasting methods. There are actually many quantitative forecasting methods, and there's a lot that you could learn. In this course, we only have time to give you a very brief taste of the statistical forecasting. There are many courses that you could take just to learn about, and which consists of entire courses of quantitative forecasting methods. Okay, let's look at this example of the method. Do you notice any patterns in the demand plot? What you see is that the demand firstly seems to be generally going up over time. And also you see some sort of seasonality. So at certain periods, certain months, the demand seems to be very high, and at other months, the demand tends to be quite low. So this demand seems to have some trend of going up, some seasonality, highs, cyclical highs and lows, as well as some random noise. So basically what quantitative forecasting methods do is they separate the demand into a trend, into a seasonality, as well as the random noise or the shocks that don't have any particular predictable pattern. Alright, that's the end of today's video. See you again soon.